Hello and welcome. I'm Alex Promos, Head of Institutional Content and Investment Magazine, and this is Market Narratives. This show is a series of unorthodox conversations with thought leaders influencing the world of fiduciary investors. For more related insights and analysis, please remember to check out our website, investmentmagazine.com.au, and subscribe for a free email. And with that, please enjoy this week's episode. My guest today is Kyle Lidbury, Head of Investment Research at Perpetual Private. Welcome, Kyle. Thanks very much, Alex. So I thought today we would get a bit of a backdrop to Perpetual Private because you're an interesting organization and firm in terms of how you think about sort of um, the client base. You know, you've got traditionally um, you know, trusts, charities, endowments as your, as your group. So it's not sort of seen as a traditional institutional investor and it's not also seen as you know, a, a traditional sort of high net worth private, um, you know, advisory firm. So how do you think about it in terms of your client backdrop and then how your investment process maybe you know, maps to that? Yep, sure. Uh, so perpetual private's probably um, uh, one of the lesser known parts of perpetual. Perpetual is obviously really well known for its funds management business and it's been very successful. Uh, however, the part of the business that I come from, I sort of think of as the oldest part of the business. Perpetual has been around since 1886 and we were essentially a business that was founded to look after other people's money as a, as a trustee business. And so perpetual private encompasses that historic, you know, personal trustee business where uh, we were entrusted with other people's assets to look after on their behalf. Uh, and and in doing so, we developed a really strong investment approach around that. And that essentially gave birth to perpetual investments and, um, you know, very successful businesses overall. But that's really the core of our heritage. We're a trustee business. We're set up to look after other people's wealth and I think it's a really important part of what we do because we don't have that varied background in Australian financial services. You know, we're not a, a broker, we're not a life insurer, we're not a bank. You know, we were just we're just a firm that's set up to look after people's assets. So that's really the core of what we do. We do that through trusts. We can do that through various types of trusts, but we also provide advice alongside of that. And so we are a high net worth business. Unlike a lot of businesses as well, though, we're not, we do run super assets, but it's a smaller part of business, about a third of the dealership. And about a quarter to a third of our business is looking after trusts, philanthropic trusts, charitable trusts, and not for profits endowments. So it's a really interesting part of the market. And it, it's that blend of what you were talking about, that institutional focus, but bringing it to a, a different part of the market, I guess, outside of the traditional super fund institutions but also being quite different to the traditional dealerships that we see. So how, how would you say maybe your portfolio structure maybe would change to say a traditional maybe super fund um, in their approach? I think we're just a lot more aware of the individual client. So be it in advice. So we are truly a high net worth business. Our average client size is over $3 million. And then we also do small institutions in that charitable space, you know, anywhere from 10 to you know, 100, even up, up to 300 mil in some cases, but around that 10 to 30 mark is where the majority of that client base would sit. Being a trustee, I think the obligation to provide excellent investment outcomes has always been there. So as, as such, we have a very strongly well-resourced team, you know, that I would suggest is institutional grade. So we run the multi-manager funds within our business. We also run our implemented portfolio set and um, as well as the traditional dealer group mechanisms such as model portfolios and approved product lists. Because mm. we've got that trustee base though, we, we, um, we don't just focus on super. So as a part of that, for example, we, we deal a lot with in perpetuity trusts and endowments. So we spend a lot of our governance budget, a lot of our team's time around researching alternative assets, you know, very much in line with the endowment model. While we can't go to that extreme, like in terms of sort of upping that, those alternative investments uh, to say 50 or 60% of the portfolio, we do see alternatives as a really strong diversifier of people's assets. We're not looking to gain outsized returns, but what we are trying to do is get good diversification within growth and defensive asset classes to make more resilient portfolios and provide better protection over time. And so, you know, our investment philosophy is to protect and grow our clients' wealth. 
Um, and that's what we try to do, build more resilient portfolios that can navigate a broader range of market conditions, preserve capital, and there, therefore have more capital to participate in the upside when markets resume their normal trend. Uh, and, and it's worked well. It's worked well over the history of the firm. So it's a, it's a good thing to, a good approach to take. It's interesting you sort of talk about the the need for defensive assets and so forth. And I guess with an endowment backdrop, you've obviously need to spin off cash um, there for them to fund their various operations or other activities. It almost seems similar to some somewhat of the retirement style pools that uh, we see in the institutional super space. Um, they haven't seemed to really be be too advanced as to where they've got to. You know, is there any sort of learnings that you have from the endowment model that may transition to? to sort of helping for a retirement style portfolio? Yeah, look, we focused on generation of, of income, um, but it's also due to a, a lot of historical trust structures where they do have a very clear delineation between the capital and income. Only income can be distributed, capital needs to be retained, or even in terms of trusts where you've got separate capital and income beneficiaries. So we do have, I guess, a stronger focus around the nature of the return that's coming through. That being said, you know, like you were saying, for pension clients in, in the super environment, those vehicles are actually, um, well, I mean, tax exempt. So we need to be aware that we've got a good su- section of our client base are tax exempt there, as are our not-for-profit and charitable clients as well. And you know, things like dividend and franking uh, income comes, you know, plays a much more important role for tax exempt investors where they're effectively getting a, a check back from the ATO. So we're aware of that and we design portfolios with that in mind. There is some client counsel though around these vehicles because they don't necessarily have that strong, um, you know, requirement to return income. They can take a total return approach. And so just in the super space where pensions, you know, it's, it's really not so much about whether it's capital or income, but what is the the total return of the portfolio after tax. Um, And then likewise, within the not-for-profit portfolios, they are also tax exempt. Um, But modern structures such as the ancillary funds, be they public or private ancillary funds, can actually take a total return approach because their distribution requirements are quoted as a percentage of NAV as opposed to it being a a capital or income split. Usually, you know, in that space, though, clients have a really strong emotional attachment to only spending income. And so we have to coach a lot of clients around understanding that total return is actually a better approach. You don't, you know, sometimes that return will be uh, have a higher proportion of, of, of capital. Sometimes that return has a higher proportion of income. That really shouldn't matter to those types of clients. And so we still, you know, I think most of the industry deals with that, still have to coach clients around that uh, and get them away from just that. You know, idea of living off the income per se. Uh, and that challenge has only increased with traditional fixed income really, really struggling, obviously, for, for returns. And, um, you know, the only way you can generate income these days is to maybe move into some of the, the higher risk style credit um, options, um, which can provide that additional yield. But I guess then it becomes other issues. So I guess, how do you think about that? You, you mentioned total return is the focus. But you know, at the same need, you need to, to generate income and you don't really sometimes want to sell down some of the assets, particularly during volatile times. What, you know, how, do, how does credit maybe play into the role and, and maybe even having cash on the side to sort of help them sort of uh, generate income effectively? Yeah, look, I think individuals at large, they, they, they get, they understand the concept of equities. You know, they, they see the, the stock market in the news, um, you know, and to the extent of international equities, you know, that used to be a hurdle, but now, you know, such you know, large businesses, we, we have a lot of clients that will invest directly in Google and, you know, Microsoft and Amazon, et cetera. So um, I think equities is well understood by people in general. However, the role of fixed income and what fixed income is, is, is definitely a, a lesser known part of the portfolio. And but still necessary, and so you, a lot of conversations we have with clients is given where cash rates are, given where bond yields are. Why am I investing in these securities? I still need an income. I still need a return to live off in retirement, or I still need a return to fund the programs and my mission, as you know, the charity's mission that uh, the endowment may serve. So understanding that need for diversification in portfolios is still really strong, um, but also understanding the types of risks that are in fixed income portfolios is, is an area of education that we have to 
often do for clients. So when returns are so low in that part of the portfolio, I think people tend to just want to either go down the credit spectrum, you know, as in go down from say investment grade to high yield or or junk bonds. And then likewise, you know, to try and make a bit of return on bond portfolios, they might be going down the duration curve. So just increasing the duration of those portfolios to try and generate an actual real return. And so being aware of what clients are doing, um, understanding that by going down the credit spectrum, they're actually increasing risk in their portfolio because credit is, you know, um, correlated with equities. Uh, so that return is coming at a cost and it's coming at a significantly cost, uh, high cost. It may not be worth the increase in risk in the portfolio given the return you're seeking. Uh, and you see a lot of clients that might be looking at bank hybrids on the stock exchange or in, you know, some of these sub-investment grade credit trusts or private credit vehicles. It's not that these these... Uh, exposures aren't valid and um, they do, you know, you you want to have some of these exposures in your portfolio, but you don't want to have them at the expense of other assets that also provide diversification. And if anything that the the sell down over, over March taught us was that need for diversification is really important and people that had gone too far down those risk spectrums were actually, um, you know, uh, quite exposed because those protective parts of the portfolio didn't act like that when when the equity markets uh, drew down. You, you talk a lot about diversification and maybe alternatives as, as playing that part. And, and the other piece you just touched on there is the uh, increased correlation with some of these higher risk pieces that, you know, whenever you've got some risk off event, they, they become very highly correlated. You know, how do you feel maybe, you know, the portfolio has, has evolved in the last you know, 10 years in terms of how do you think about building all the different uh, parts of the portfolio, maybe thinking about the portfolio in different buckets and so forth to, to try and make sure that it achieves its objectives, but also has that true defensive characteristic as well? Yeah, we. it really comes down to what's your investment strategy, uh, what's your investment view in terms of asset classes and what are you looking for from them? So, when we look at our alternatives program, we run a little over a billion dollars in alternatives. Uh, the program's been running for um, over 11 years now. And so when we choose to invest in alternatives, what we're looking for is we're looking for a diversifying characteristic in portfolios. So be it a growth characteristic or a defensive characteristic, you know, in our growth alternatives, we're looking for equity-like returns over the cycle, but we're looking for a lower correlation with equity markets. Not a negative correlation, just a lower correlation. Mm -hmm. uh, and we're also looking to harvest different premiums. So be that the illiquidity premium by investing in illiquid assets, you can get an illiquidity premium. Uh, be it through a skill-based return. And, and in our experience, and I guess aligned with our philosophy, we believe that in illiquid or inefficient markets, managers have a greater ability to exercise skill. And so the likelihood of alpha from those portfolios, given the set of tools that a manager has available, be it a private equity manager that can actually go in and affect real change at the company level, or be it a private credit manager that can be very selective, have a very strong relationship with their borrowers and be able to agree to flexible terms in terms of a, a yield premium. It's those sorts of premiums that we're looking for in, in our alternative assets, which diversify that equity beta in the, in the growth portfolio um, or, or you know, the, the bond or duration risk in the fixed income portfolio. So it really comes down to that philosophical view and, and that's why we... Uh, spend the time looking at alternative assets and doing the due diligence. It doesn't mean that it's it's not introducing a different set of risks into the portfolio. You need to be aware of um, the illiquidity. You need to be aware of the the lockup and you know the fact that you need to do really strong due diligence on on your investment selection to ensure that you are avoiding those mistakes because. You know, unlike in public markets where if you make a mistake, you can you know, terminate a manager or you can move out of that or transition the portfolio relatively easily, making a mistake on the alternative side, you might be stuck in those assets for a very long time. So you need to spend enough of your um, research budget there to ensure that that doesn't happen. Um, but you know, as I said, we've, we've found it a really fruitful and a really good um, area to invest on behalf of clients. I think our clients have really benefited from that uh, diversification over the last few months as well. So, um, and and over the, the longer term. So, 
we're happy with the way that things are going. I think it, our clients are also relatively happy as well. So it's it's been a good good part of the portfolio to spend time on and invest in. You, you mentioned quite a few times there about sort of the skill that comes alongside this place and the due diligence. So is it fair to say that you're, you're relatively active across uh, across this whole alternative space? Like is in active looking for active managers? Oh yeah, like I mean, we're we're an active house. We we strongly believe in the value of active management, and it is again from that protect and, and risk focus. Uh, a market cap way to benchmark is not inherently capital protective. Uh, we want to have an ability to selectively choose stocks, be they from a quality perspective, so ensuring that you're investing in companies with robust balance sheets, strong cash flow, be it from a social perspective. You know, I think um, you know that increasing awareness of responsible investment and and an ability to select stocks or or companies that are able to make good inroads around their social or corporate responsibilities. Yeah, there's lots of reasons why we strongly believe, I guess, in active management. And so, um, likewise, on the alternative space, uh, we're not hugely focused on, say, the broad liquid alternatives or or rules-based alternatives programs. We are looking for that fundamental... um, active management and ability to add value in portfolios, be it through, uh, you know, as I said, private equity managers or special situations, people that have skill and experience um, within certain sectors and certain locales. Um, that's really what we try to focus on. And so um, we're not active from the perspective of, you know, once you're in that sort of alternatives program, you do need to constantly be doing follow-on funds as you get more capital into your funds. And as our business has been growing, uh, we've been getting inflows into our alternatives programs, which is a great place to be. Um, So we're constantly looking to either follow on with our existing manager set. um, Yeah. And by doing that, you concentrate that focus on particular managers, although you might be across two, three or four vintages of their funds within a certain space or within different parts of their business. Um, it, it's I, we are active from that perspective, and we you know we're active in terms of how we monitor and our relationships with those managers as well. It's interesting you so sort of, you talked about um, private equity and special situations and and the, the the reference to alternatives. I guess historically alternatives was seen as anything but uh, equities and bonds. Now alternatives is you know things like property. You haven't mentioned um, property as as one of them. Is is that also considered part of your alternatives bucket? We have property on both sides of the portfolio. So on the traditional side, we do have a separate sleeve or allocation to listed real estate investment trusts. From a philosophy perspective of we believe the best core property in the world usually ends up in in REITs. And so that that would be our focus in terms of core property is finding managers that can on our on our clients' behalf do a really good job of managing portfolios of Australian and global REITs. And that's how we invest on that side of the ledger, I guess, if you want to call it that. But then in the alternative space, that tends to be where we take our more value add strategies in property. And so we don't invest in a lot of core property in the alternative space. We do invest in real estate debt. We've got you know, managers that manage portfolios of UK mortgages and, and US mortgages, unlisted and private mortgages. Uh, but we do, from an equity perspective, focus on more value-add strategies, more opportunistic strategies um, on the alternative space and take that illiquidity. So any any investment that has an illiquid aspect to it, we do tend to take that exposure in the alts programs because our clients have a good understanding of the fact that that part of the portfolio doesn't have the same liquidity as the traditional side of their book. So, yeah, I mean, we're, we're active investors in, po- in property and, and infrastructure for that matter. We also do that in the alts program. Um, we haven't seen good value in that um, core property segment for a while, I guess. So, then, you know, we've definitely seen better value now than we were previously. Um, and I think the value of active management um, in both approaches has been really yeah, really strong in coming through this market environment as well. So we've avoided, you know, difficult sectors or we've had underweights to sectors that have been unduly hit by the crisis, such as retail and commercial, and had stronger, you know, stronger investments in other other parts of the market. So, um, yeah, we, you know, we do, we do take our property exposure across the book and see it as a really good 
um, you know, strong real asset to invest in. It, it's interesting you talked about valuations being being quite high in, in a number of areas, and I guess there's there's a number of people that think valuations are high across the whole spectrum of of uh, equities and bonds and and real estate and, and the, the, the works at the moment. You know, how do you how do you sort of take that maybe backdrop around valuations, and then at the same time make sure that you sort of coordinate or map back to your traditional endowments that are really careful, you know, really focused on. Um, you know, minimizing uh, you know tail risk or any sort of real large drawdowns. You know, how, how does that sort of process work? Do you, do you evolve the SAA in terms of valuations and and almost do relative value across it? How do, how do you think about it? Yeah, look, I, our asset allocation process is very strongly valuation focused. I think most uh, most institutions um, do that. Uh, values. I think over the long term, value does tend to prevail. You know, like buying the right asset at the right price. You know, fundamentally, it's just a common sense approach to investing, and it's the way most successful investors um, approach any you know investment and assets. But it does take a while for that to play out, and valuation as a um, as a tool for shorter term decisions, I think. Um, it can that can actually lead to a lot of pain in short or medium term contexts. Um, you do need to temper that value focus with other things, um, with other um, signals. And so um, we don't tend to be too active from an asset allocation perspective, uh, but we are active in investors. And so when you look at our book, um, say even just say the the international equities book, for example, we um, have a you know about six different types of uh, managers in there. We're looking for managers that have a low correlation of excess return, but all we do really value that um, capital protective aspect. We give them very broad mandates. Um, all of our international managers are, me- are benchmarked against all country world. And the reason for that is we believe that that fundamental bottom-up approach is a better way to find opportunities um, and then drive whatever weight we may have towards emerging markets or developed markets. And so if our managers are finding better value or better opportunities to invest in, in emerging markets, which results in our portfolio moving that way, that that for us is a, a more reliable way of tilting portfolios um, than for us to make some sort of a top-down decision on whether we should be overweight emerging or overweight developing uh, developed markets. So... Um, that being said, you know, we do take some thoughtful tilting from time to time. Um, you know, coming into March, we were overweight global REITs compared to Aussie, um, you know, coming in, which uh, helped a lot. And we do take positions in cash. So we will dial up our target cash returns. That doesn't mean we, we wholesale move the portfolio, but that might be moving from, say, 5 to 10% cash within our portfolios to ensure that we've got some dry powder and provide some protection, you know, when markets are running pretty hot or, or feeling pretty overvalued. It's interesting you, t- you talked about sort of the all country world index as, as being a benchmark. One of the, the big concerns, I think, within the, the super fund space is that they're all peer aware, they're all trying to get the highest return, be top of the top of the table so they can get the inflows. But, you know, you never seem to get much of an understanding about the risk that, that underlies some of these these challenges. In the case that you're talking about being much more of a fundamental value-driven approach, yes, it may be um, a steady-as-she-goes style of you know, performance um, outlook. Um, obviously, value has, has struggled as a, as a technique for a while, but, obviously, but before that, it has done extremely well. How do you sort of maybe balance the, the pressures of like keeping up with the, the, the funds that you know, in the super fund space versus really keeping the philosophy around active management, true value, cash flows, and so forth. Yeah, we don't really see the the super funds as competitors to us. Um, I think that's, uh, you yeah, know, that's a really good thing for us. You know, because our clients are all advised, we actually get to have a conversation with our clients uh, around their portfolios. Uh, we deliver advice in a holistic manner. So investments is just one piece of that. You know, my team supports our broader advisor base in terms of the investment solutions, investment offerings, and we're just focused on bringing the absolute best practice investment portfolios that we can for clients. But in addition to that, our advisors have to be across a broad range of different things such as strategy and structure, um, you know, uh, estate planning, philanthropic um, goals, etc. So um, we 
think that we can bring really good value to clients. Their advice fee gets, you know, if we want to prove value in terms of the advice space, we want to be delivering a holistic and very broad offer so that our clients can get the full benefit of our expertise. And and as a firm, we believe that we've got a lot of different tools that we can bring to bear for clients uh, and a lot of specialist advice. So um, we don't necessarily just see performance as our our key you know success factor. We want to bring performance in a um, capital preservation way. And so our approach, again, that protect and grow philosophy, we want to build a portfolio that's going to be resilient. It may not, you know, it may struggle to keep up with markets when things are running hard, but when um, when things sell off, that tends to be when we outperform, like we have done in the last um, couple of downturns. And that's really what our clients are looking for from us. So it, it's not an accident that we manage money this way it's it's really driven by our client approach and this is what our clients are asking for we're dealing with wealthy clients they don't want to lose their wealth once they've built it it's usually pretty hard earned and so um you know we can have that conversation we can explain to clients what's happening in the portfolios we can give them very very good transparency you know we've we've built specialist performance engines for our more sophisticated boards and trustees that demand that type of transparency and information so we can give really granular transparent information on the portfolio as to why or why not performance is what it is um and then you know how the portfolio is positioned uh given the environment and and what we're you know looking to move into which is a very you know we still believe we'll be in a really volatile period for the next few months if not longer and so that's that's our value proposition to clients from our investment perspective it's really interesting you talk about sort of the communication tools and that's one of the the challenges that a lot of super funds have in terms of client you know talking to their members they can't talk to all their members they don't have portfolios that individually uh, built for their members it's you know through a cohort as such you know, how, how do you feel that, you know, your ability to sort of talk more one-on-one -on -one with clients has sort of helped them through this, you know, this volatility we've seen obviously most recently and we've seen it pop up a few more, trying to actually sort of, uh, you know, talk them through the process, talk them through this market volatility. You know, it's, it's very easy to sort of have a plan until then, you know, we're down 30% on, on the S&P 500 and people that plan wants to be thrown out the window what's what does that look like and and how much do you feel that that's a you know really long term process where they even understand the underlying investments that they that they're holding i've actually been really um, quite impressed with with the way that our clients have acted through the last few months generally speaking uh, yeah there were very very few i could count on one hand the number of clients that did panic and did sell out at um you know, uh, the debt once the markets had, had turned down, and that was against our advice. However, um, all in all, clients have actually been quite calm and quite prepared because we do talk to them about this um, on an ongoing basis. And it's a huge advantage to be able to have that engagement with your clients. I think at the end of the day, no one's worked out a really good way of engaging with members or engaging with clients outside of advice. Advice is something that's needed. And it is going to be one of the biggest challenges for the industry going forward is how can advice be provided to members in a way that, um, you know, makes it affordable. And let's face it, like the cost of our advice is going up uh, and it's going up across the industry just in terms of the increased compliance burden, the increased, um, you know, focus on um, those principles. I think by and large, as a business, we've done pretty well because we've always had that fiduciary core. We've always had that really strong focus around best interests and, um, you know, we've always been fee for service. So all of those things have actually been to our advantage as we've gone through this difficult time in the industry. Being able to have a conversation with your clients around what's going on is hugely advantageous from an investor's perspective. And so, you know, we haven't seen significant outflows uh, over this period, even with the, the government withdrawal schemes. Yeah, you know, when you look at the book where we actually have a conversation with our clients versus say some legacy books where we don't have that engagement, yeah, you know, we are getting a much higher level of outflow or a much higher level of turnover on the um on the non-advised portion of our business. So um, I, I really enjoy being an investor within an advised business. I think it also makes our alternatives program possible because uh, we can actually um, talk to clients about what's in there, you know. And I think the biggest issue that you generally have is is when 
um, expectations don't match. And so if you've been dealing to an expectation around liquidity and something that just doesn't provide liquidity, I think that's where you get into trouble as an advisor or as a, as you know someone that's recommended investments into a product because we can be very explicit around what our clients are investing in in terms of those portfolios and we do temper those portfolios are generally our clients would have about 15 percent in alternatives so it's um and and that's because of the illiquidity of, of those programs you can just match up that expectation a lot better and um be able to talk about what's going on and generally speaking if you're trusted i think people will be very calm through these types of markets, like much calmer than you think they would be. So it's been it's been a, a good, it's been actually quite a rewarding experience um, coming through this downturn. You, you mentioned there, you know, making sure that the customers understand what's what's in there in their portfolio. Um, a number of uh, you know strategies that I've seen across the institutional space are getting more and more complex. Um, and you know, I, I'd, I'd be very Curious to know whether a lot of members within the again, I talk about the super fund space, a little bit different to your space. But do they, you know, do you try to really make sure that what you do invest in the the client do understand? You know, just to try and make sure that there isn't that mismatch of expectations, because there are some. Yeah, yeah. It, it is, Alex. It's more around the expectation, right? Like I think some of the things that we invest in, in say the special situation space or private credit space, can be quite difficult. Um, for for clients to get their heads around the technicalities of of what's going on and the and the, the products that they are, uh, what we do talk to them about is just expectations and the fact that you know we have various levels of liquidity in our else programs. We do have exposures in there that are daily traded, but likewise, you know, out the other end of the spectrum, we've got you know funds that are either ten to twelve year lockups or even evergreen funds where there is you know. It, um, there isn't necessarily an end date at all. Uh, but again, you know, taking the view on illiquidity, yeah, and and even, you know, some things like we we saw some more esoteric credit products in the market really lock up. Um, you know, spreads really widened on a lot of credit products or fixed income products through the crisis. Um, and it also brings to attention the limitations of your client base too, right? Like I think... Um, some dealer groups approach asset allocation as something that they can just do very quickly. But when you look at the limitations that retail clients have on being able to switch in and out of investments, and if they wanted to switch out of some of these credit products where spreads blew out to over 1%, you know, they might have cost them 2% just to move from um, you know, credit to equities. And so being aware of what actually happens to clients' books um, I think it's really important and it's really enabled through that advice conversation. Um, it's also an area where I think, you know, um, uh, you know, certain types of structures don't deal to that well. Yeah, you know, we've seen this huge growth in managed accounts and we, we run managed accounts for our clients, absolutely. Uh, but you need to run it with an awareness of what's going on and of, of the mechanisms that your investors have at the end, end of the line. So you do see some fund managers set up books where their uh, managed account portfolio might be directly linked to a fund. Mm -hmm. And when you look at, you know, portfolio managers within their funds are able to trim and trade and, and move that portfolio around a lot very cost effectively and very efficiently. But if you're doing that in, in a managed account context, the, the transactional costs really blow out and massively affect performance. And so the performance experience of the managed account holders can be markedly different to say fund unit holders. When we run our managed accounts, we absolutely understand that the end clients are individuals who are holding these assets. So we have very you know, strict expectations around turnover, um, how we trade the books very different to how a fund manager would trade the book, for example. Um, so you know, that awareness of the client experience, the awareness of how that product translates to the client experience is really important for us. Um, and it's something that, you know, we really focus on. All right. That's been a fantastic conversation. Thank you very much for your time today, Kyle. Thanks, Alex. Really appreciate the time. Thank you for joining us. All views expressed on this podcast are subject to change and do not necessarily reflect the views of Connexus Financial. This podcast is for educational purposes only and should not be relied upon as investment advice.